Now, the clinical guidelines for portable monitoring were developed to sort of guide uh, the practice of using portable monitoring devices. And it's what you'll see, it's not about just about the device, it's about how it's used. And, um, and that's so critical in everything in medicine. It's not just the device, it's not just the technology, it's the people that are doing the studies, interpreting them, and taking care of patients. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine knew that portable monitoring was coming. So they very wisely uh, had a group develop consensus guidelines. Now, and these are mostly consensus guidelines, um, but I think they're very reasonable and have really been accepted by most of the practitioners in the field. But it's always important to think why these <laughs> guidelines were made. So I have a few disclosures. I've done uh, research with a few uh, companies, uh, some of which had to do with portable monitoring. So first of all, let's talk about when portable monitoring is indicated. So the very first thing is, is that the diagnosis, use of portable monitoring requires that a comprehensive sleep evaluation be performed along with the portable monitoring. Ideally, it should be performed before portable monitoring. It's important to really know the symptoms that the patient has and know if they have important comorbidities, as we'll talk about. Um, and I'll, because, in other words, knowing that helps you in, know what to do with the results of the study. Also, clinical sleep evaluations must be supervised by a practitioner with board certification in sleep medicine or an individual who fills the eligibility criteria. The idea there is, is that you should have a knowledgeable person interpreting the studies uh, who actually looks at the tracings and, and can evaluate the, the big picture as far as the patient, his symptoms, and, and what to do next. Provided that those recommendations, portable monitoring may be used as an alternative to PSG for diagnosis of OSA in patients with a high pretest probability of moderate to severe OSA. So why moderate to severe? Well, as already been discussed, when you have an, um, an AHI by portable monitor, you take up, count all the events, and you don't divide by the total sleep time, you divide by the portable monitoring time. So you're dividing by a larger number, and so it tends to minimize the AHI. But if you have 30, if you have 15 to 60 events per hour, that's l less likely to be a false negative. So even though the AHI is lower than you would get on a in-lab PSG, it's still going to be in the diagnostic range. So these are the kind of patients that are most suitable. Um, and um, it, it, they're the ones that have fairly high AHIs and that don't have that much night-to-night -night variability or uh, the variability in position or sleep stage. When is portable monitoring not indicated? It's not indicated for the diagnosis of OSA when there's significant comorbid medical conditions that may degrade the accuracy of portable monitoring. And these include moderate to severe pulmonary disease, neuromuscular disease, or congestive heart failure. Well, let's think about it a minute. Why, why, was these, why is this important? Well, if you have moderate to severe pulmonary disease, you can certainly have drops in oxygen with very few events. So perhaps that's not the best study for patients like that. If you have neuromuscular disease, you may well hypoventilate, um, and of course the portable monitoring won't pick that up. Uh, if you have congestive heart failure, you may have central apneas and chain stokes breathing. And even if portable monitoring picks that up, you're not going to put such a person on an auto titrator. In fact, none of those that I've talked about are you going to put on an auto titrator. So it's not just that these patients are not good candidates for a portable monitor. They wouldn't be a very good candidate for um, something other than a PSG titration. And if you're going to do a PSG titration, maybe the better idea would be a split study. So that's some of the thinking behind why these patients are not good patients for portable monitoring. Having said that, sometimes people slip through the system and I see, whoa, chain stokes breathing. 
And that's very important because those are patients that need some special care. Portable monitoring is not indicated when other sleep diagnoses or sleep disorders are likely. And if your person has a parasomnia, obviously you need digital and, uh, video and audio and EEG to be able to be sure that, that they're not having a seizure or to characterize the parasomnia. If they have a chance of uh, suspected narcolepsy, they may well have a very low AHI or borderline AHI, but really what you need is a sleep study, possibly and an MSLT. So that, again, these candidates, are, these patients are good candidates. So in your history in evaluating the patient, you would have asked them, well, do you snore? Do you have cataplexy? And if they had sort of a really weak story for sleep apnea, but a very promising story for narcolepsy, then of course portable monitoring wouldn't be the study that you would order. And last, portable monitoring is not indicated for general screening of asymptomatic populations. In other words, there's just no data to support this. Um, now portable monitoring could conceivably be useful uh, for certain high-risk populations where there's a high incidence of, uh, of sleep apnea, uh, for example, truck drivers. Again, this, um, the data is not there yet to recommend that, but that is at least a potential. So, so when is portable monitoring indicated beside moderate to severe sleep apnea? As already mentioned, if you a patient can't get in the sleep lab uh, because they're too wide to fit in the door, uh, which does happen sometimes, or they're very difficult to move, or they're unstable, then really uh, going to them in the ICU or in their medical ward might be the best and most convenient uh, approach. And so certainly this has been one use of portable monitoring from the beginning of uh, their technology. And last, portable monitoring can be useful to monitor the response of non, of, of non CPAP treatments for obstructive sleep apnea. For example, uh, oral appliances, upper airway surgery, weight loss. So uh, as you know, with an oral appliance, they're adjusted. And I'm sorry, I left out two slides in your handout, but uh, that's what comes of making these talks up at 2 in the morning, I think. So um, anyway, uh, you, you know the way oral appliances, it's fitted, and you slowly protrude the mandible. So what would happen is, is you don't want to spend the money doing an expensive in-lab study, um, even if you decided that's what you wanted to do to verify treatment efficacy until the thing was optimally titrated. So you might do a portable study to just uh, see how you, you're done. Now, what's the alternative to that? The alternative is the so-called um, WIFE portable sleep study, which is a very accurate sleep study. Uh, if someone is no longer snoring and having apnea, they very well may not be snoring and having apnea. But certainly portable monitoring allows us to do this. Um, so sometimes labs that they realize that they may not make enough money even to, to meet expenses, they could certainly help take care of a patient um, uh, for this kind of problem. So why? is a comp comprehensive evaluation so important? And we've already talked a little bit about this. First of all, we just don't want to order this on everyone. Uh, every, uh, possibly every snore, there are a lot of snores in the United States, and if uh, we ordered and, and the government paid for a study on each one of these patients, that would certainly be overutilization. So that's why clinical assessment is, is important. On the other hand, there are people that minimize their symptoms and so that's why it's important uh, to really evaluate them. Uh, secondary, uh, second, as I already mentioned, it's these comorbid medical conditions are so important to identify, not simply because you won't be able to make the diagnosis, but because what are you going to do when they have sleep apnea? If they need special titration studies, et cetera, then I mean, they would be ha probably be better handled in the first place by a PSG. Also, there's a lot of room for error, as already been mentioned, in leads falling off. And so quality assurance and quality assurance uh, for the scoring of the data is important. And um, I'm going to show you a few examples later. Uh, there's always no substitute for looking at the raw data. And last, as I also mentioned, they're, if they're positive, what's the next step? At RVA, there are very few negative studies. 
very few negative studies. And so if we didn't have a plan for what to do with all those patients that were positive, then um, we wouldn't really be uh, any further along. Um, we uh, use auto titration in a lot of our patients or treat them with an auto titration device. But that requires special expertise and other talks are going to address that. Um, so in other words, we thought ahead in designing our system. On the other hand, patients that are more severe or have these complications, we send toward the, the routine pathways of monitoring.